but let's shift to you, Anand, and I'm excited uh, to hear what, uh, what our, our panelists are going to say. Thank you, Mark. As always, it's been great uh, partnering together and getting to know the 361 firm uh, platform and, and community. Um, so I, I would disagree. This is also helping the world. I think people using uh, legal cannabis that's safe and using it in the right ways and the right portions and not using alcohol, quite frankly, uh, is going to help the world and change how people think and improve uh, improve the, in, 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 the, the global landscape. Uh, and that's why I'm in this, actually. Uh, for the next 10 years in particular, Bar Capital's purpose is to make cannabis as common and culturally accepted as aspirin or alcohol. I always say that, but I, I wake up believing that. And um, so this series is tying into that because a lot of it has to do with, is the capital going to flow in the right places to make this industry develop and become an actual industry? It, it is very, very nascent still. And, uh, and on a personal note, being somebody who's from the finance world, um, I don't like seeing capital go to the wrong investments just because somebody pitched it a certain way or put a spin on it and, you know, fooled a bunch of people to invest in something uh, that was not uh, appropriate. So the more I, I can help and, and collaborate with uh, Mark and others to bring light, uh, shed light on the right um, uh, folks to consider uh, in looking at this space, the, the better it is for uh, for the industry. Um, so tying that thought together, um, you know, the goal of this session is uh, we call it full spectrum investing. Full spectrum extraction is when you take a cannabis plant and you're able to keep the terpene and cannabinoid profile. So basically all the essentialness of that plant into the, the product and, um, and capture the benefits of the interactions between those uh, cannabinoids and terpenes. So full spectrum investing today is going to be taking your life better off the water. Uh, somebody's got reverb coming through. Uh, full spectrum investing today is going to be focused on um, allowing us to look at the non-systemic side of investing in the space. So not an ETF that's trying to be passive and, and focus only on public securities, but the other options that fit into an alternative investment portfolio. And, and we think that cannabis is going to become essential in every alternative investment portfolio because of its characteristics, which I won't uh, digress into right now. But uh, in terms of admin notes, you know, all the speakers should know that they can share their screen uh, whenever they like. They don't need permission. Uh, I've, I think I've shown most of the speakers at this point the yellow background that myself or Mark might have if, if it's taking up too much time. We always open up the conversation in depth uh, uh, later in the call because the best part is the audience participation and Q&A and panelist participation. I will set a couple of topics as um, framing for kind of um, introductions for the, the panelists. Each panelist will introduce for three to five minutes just who they are, maybe share a few slides so we get a sense and I'll, I'll kind of transition through that. And then at the end, we'll go into a couple of avenues today. One will be uh, the life cycle of a, of a company uh, from the investor perspective, as well as the company manage management perspective, as well as the fund manager's perspective, which is really great for this panel because we can capture all of those perspectives that it takes to get a company to be successful and, and go through that process, as well as every, everybody along that chain. Um, so, so that'll start from angel level uh, with, with a few of our panelists today who, who have experience on that front, and it'll end with um, the hedge fund level where uh, it's dealing with public uh, long short decisions. Uh, the other avenue we'll be exploring is um, if, if we had $10 million uh, as an investor to put into these various choices, how would we think about which ones to select and why and, and what, what would we kind of look to, to allocate towards these different areas. Um, the, the interesting thing here is, you know, investing in cannabis can come from so many angles uh, and, and each one requires different levels of resources and due diligence and um, activity. But the, uh, most of the panelists here today and then most of the choices here today are, uh, they're complementary. They're not, you know, competitive in nature in terms of I should pick one or, over the other. So we'll get into a discussion around that. But without you know, further ado, I want to launch into um, talking to the panelists because they're the main focus here. Uh, and I'll kind of jump in and, and transition as needed. And I thank uh, the other 
uh, moderators and, 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 you know, I'll be queuing them uh, and, and uh, sending over uh, to them uh, later on. But uh, we'll start um, first with uh, Paul Beattie, uh, who is uh, on the call. I just wanted to confirm. And if you could go back a profile, uh, Anessa, there we go. Uh, we'll start here at the macro level, I'll say, um, and we're now uh, looking at the public side uh, at the hedge fund level. Uh, I'll let Paul give his own uh, bio and, and anything else he wants to share. And, uh, you know, you've got uh, till 11.45 or so, uh, Paul, if you want to take the stage and, and, and run with it. Thanks very much. Well, I won't take too much time, uh, certainly, but uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, we run a, a hedge fund up here in Canada, out of Montreal. We have offices in Toronto, uh, and we've been investing actively in the uh, in the cannabis space uh, since the beginning. Right? All these companies came to Canada to go public because the federal laws in the U.S. Uh, haven't permitted it just yet. So, uh, let me tell you, we've been uh, we've met with probably 150 uh, cannabis companies. Uh, we know the uh, management teams of the top 20. I've uh, met with them multiple times. Uh, uh, we, are, we love the space. We call it actually the investment opportunity of a lifetime uh, or at least a generation. Uh, why is that? Well, you know, it's not often you get uh, an entire uh, uh, industry to emerge uh, into the public forum, right, an investment forum, where the industry already exists. Okay, unlike all these other, uh, you know, technology, uh, you know, it's all about the future. Well, I guess, guess what? The, the, the cannabis industry exists already. It's $50 billion uh, in the U.S. in revenue. So let's do some simple math. Put a, put a multiple of three times revenue. You should have $150 billion of public equities in the space, give or take. Uh, what do you have right now? It's closer to 40 so we're even though the stocks have done terrifically over the last, uh, uh, you know, the last 12 months, uh, we think well, call it 50. You're, you're still going up. You still got lots of growth uh, in uh, lots of chances to make money. Uh, what we find particularly exciting, well, invest in all the largest companies, all these MSOs. They're uh, they're well run, uh, well managed. Uh, it's not easy to get these state licenses anymore, so they're, they're well established. I think they're all kind of miniature oligopolies, really. I think they're going to do very well. In the, in the U.S., you're going to be able to make money. The government's going to allow you to make money. Funnily enough, up here in Canada, uh, the government's totally screwed the whole thing up. Uh, the biggest problem is that they're not going to allow uh, the corporates to make money. They're too involved in their business. They're, they won't allow you to build a brand. Uh, how can you build a business without building a brand? It's, it's, uh, it's just not going to work. And so uh, they're involved in, uh, you know, giving out the licensing, but they're also involved in retail. They're also involved in uh, pricing uh, and they preventing companies from, uh, from building brands. So it's very simple. Get along the U.S. names, uh, buy, buy as much as you can, <laughs> as much as you can allocate, because uh, it's, it's going to be a great uh, next couple of years. Uh, we, our hedge fund is, is at the max 25% uh, long U.S. names. And then we've shorted uh, probably about 10% of the portfolio in the Canadian names. And you can basically short any of the Canadian names. So, uh, these the valuations, first of all, are, are, are too lofty uh, by any kind of metric. And, uh, and then I don't think they have the opportunity to, to generate the cash flows. So, uh, so it's a great, it's a, it's a terrific uh, uh, hedge for uh, anybody who wants to reduce their, their risk to the space. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that, uh, turn it over to the... Um, uh, turn over uh, back to you, and then, but uh, we couldn't be more bullish. We do manage separate accounts for people just to specifically invest in the uh, in uh, in the U.S. cannabis space. To give you an idea. Uh, we have one uh, one account uh, last March uh, was uh, half a million dollars. He's a professional hockey player. He said all I want to do is invest in CBD and uh, cannabis, and his portfolio is north of two and a half million bucks. Twelve months later. So uh, you can't make money in cannabis. Tell me an industry where you can make better returns. Uh, so we're, we're very excited about it, and I think it continues. Uh, and that's it. That's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. And congrats on having a stellar month last month, I believe, us also. So um, I'll uh, move along now. So we're, I'm kind of just starting at the public 
uh, position level, and then kind of now we're going to jump into the uh, and uh, next up, I'd like to to feature uh, Kato uh, Falan from Park Green Capital, which is uh, a fund of funds strategy in the cannabis space. So, uh, Kato, I'll turn it over for um, for your background and and, and for Park Green's uh, uh, details. Thanks, Alan. So uh, Park Green, we are a diversified and balanced private debt and equity cannabis fund of funds. Our goal is to harvest the expected returns in cannabis without making any bets on one state, sector, or lead investor. And we believe cannabis is a global secular growth story that is only just beginning and that a diversified approach is a better way to participate in these speculative markets and that investing with best, the, better, the best managers in the space leads to better returns. So we still believe that as Paul does, that this is one of the greatest investment stories uh, of our lifetime. It's still really early in the cannabis space. We're still building the playing field uh, in the US and around the world uh, to what cannabis will and can become. Most of the uh, investor focus or even just the uh, kind of macro focus on cannabis is really on retail or medicinal access to cannabis, but the real story uh, I believe, and, and like others believe here, is that this is going to change the, this is better for humans. This is going to change the way we live and breathe as we go forward in this life. And it'll be ubiquitous everywhere we go. Some component of CBD or THC in our daily lives, much like you have, you know, vitamin D added to milk or, or niacin added to bread, uh, and CBD or some combination of these cannabinoids will be uh, part of our lives uh, for the foreseeable future and, and make a huge impact on the global economy and our lives. As far as investing go, we really believe that uh, I came from uh, uh, dimensional fund advisors and uh, iShares and I believe in kind of passive investing. And so I really believe that uh, the investing story from the private side is, is stellar uh, for long-term growth. If you look at you know, PE valuations uh, of some of the equity stocks and, and not knocking any of my friends here that are uh, public equity uh, investors, uh, but for our fund, uh, we're private only. And the reason being is that you, know, you can buy some of the publicly traded stocks uh, at, at massive multiples, uh, and you can buy private companies at one and a half time re revenue. And these are companies that are generating real revenue, real returns, and have massive growth. And we're just trying to harvest those inside of our fund and allow folks the access to this space uh, in a way that they don't have to figure out, you know, should they go plant touching or ancillary? Should they go VC or PE? Should they go debt or equity? Uh, you're allowed to do this in our fund and get access to all of those. And so we just believe that this is the, this is the very beginning of, of, a, of this global secular growth story, and we're trying to harvest that uh, for our investors. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, Kato. Appreciate that. Um, and so now moving along again on the private side, we're going to keep diving down until we get to, you know, the, the actual um, uh, early stage companies um, in the space. Uh, so next up is uh, Maddox uh, Swenson from L2V. Uh, Maddox, if you could go over kind of which space you're focused on and, and kind of your strategy in the in the private space. Yeah, thank you, Anna, and much appreciated. Really a uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, so I'm founder of L2V. We're a uh, private investment firm focused on investments in both technology companies that service the cannabis industry as well as branded products. Uh, background uh, prior to this, I co-led M&A uh, and investments at IAC. If you don't know IAC, you're probably familiar with the uh, portfolio companies, which have included Match Group, Expedia, TripAdvisor, um, LendingTree, Vimeo, and Home Services. The thread that connects all of those companies together is they were very much facilitating the offline to online transition in whatever industry they were focused on. As Paul mentioned earlier, we're in the midst of kind of what is an offline to online transition in cannabis. It's been a many tens of billions of dollars industry that has largely been offline uh, that's coming online. Obviously, uh, the regulatory backdrop plays a, a large component in that. I got my start in the industry in 2013 and 14 when some of the states out west were you know, becoming adult use legal. Uh, and via uh, a personal invest investment in a company called LeafLink, which has become one of the largest technology companies in the space, servicing, um, you know, kind of 30 to 40% of the wholesale market in the U.S., um, spawned my journey from uh, tech and media investing into cannabis. So we closed, finalized the first close on our fund uh, earlier this year. Portfolio companies include LeafLink, uh, a consumer products company called Stillwater Brands, which makes a product called Ripple, which is a water-soluble THC powder 
that solves some of the dosing and delivery pain points in this industry and a biotech firm uh, called Celebre, which uh, manufactures cannabinoids using biosynthesis and fermentation. So we're focused on kind of the infrastructure pieces. We think the rails are being established in this industry today. And um, with that, these new platforms are throwing off a tremendous amount of data exhaust that will help inform kind of our supply chain investments, both in brands and uh, other infrastructure com companies as, as this industry matures and evolves. Thank you, Maddox, appreciate that. Um, and so kind of now transitioning to uh, some of the, the company level and investor uh, level part of the conversation. Uh, next up, I'll uh, introduce uh, Brian Cheng from Asia Horizon, uh, which is a, uh, a U.S. company focused on China. Uh, uh, and, and so I'll turn it over to you, Brian, to give kind of an overview and um, share any, any background. Great. Sounds good. Let's see. Um, am I on screen right now? You're, you're not sharing the screen yet, no. It, sometimes... you want to, do you want to share your screen, Brian? Sure. Uh, just if, uh... So it says I cannot share slides as well. Oh, okay. There you go. There we go. It just takes a Perfect. second. And some of you may remember, Brian, he was both at ArcView and he was on our... You, I remember you were sort of stuck in Hong Kong trying to get over to back to the mainland um, back in May, April, May. But here you are. <laughs> Yes, I, uh, I actually returned to Hong Kong, but uh, fortunately, things have opened up a bit more. Being able to travel uh, between China and Hong Kong, still, still the the, <laughs> the barriers are there, but it's and you uh, much our, easier than our, it was last year. And you led our cannabis panel in Miami two plus years ago, so we, we've been part of the family. Yes, and uh, very glad to be to, to be so and be able to share uh, what we're doing at Asia Horizon here today. Uh, so I'll jump right into it. So um, Brian Shane, CEO of Asia Horizon. And uh, we are uh, one of the first companies, uh, one of 16 companies, the only U.S. company to have uh, been given a license by the Chinese government to process uh, cannabinoids. And a little bit more about myself, I got my start in industry back in 2013, 2014 as well, uh, when I was the co-founder of a venture firm, uh, Fresh VC, and we were the only tech VC firm that ran around Silicon Valley convincing VC investors that cannabis was the next big movement. Unfortunately, uh, until today, still most of them are not part of the industry, uh, but um, got a very early start being the lead investor in the seed and series B round of ease, which is now the largest cannabis delivery company in the US. And in following years, joined ArcView, like Mark mentioned, uh, which is also is exclusively focused on cannabis industry. Um, and what I saw starting from 2013 was that uh, starting from California, North America, and then over the years, starting from 17, 18, the development of a global cannabis industry, just like some of the other panelists have said. Uh, we saw opportunities in South America, uh, art markets starting to open up in Europe. Um, and when I was part of ArcView, I was made subsequent bets, uh, early investor in companies like uh, Clever Leaves, which just went public on NASDAQ, it's the first Colombian company to go public on NASDAQ. But a takeaway was that what I saw was cannabis was not just a US movement or a North American movement, it was happening all over the world. And part of the biggest delta in, uh, in, in the opportunity was understanding when a country was actually legalizing, when most people didn't feel comfortable investing in cannabis in different jurisdictions and being able to bet on the best operators in those geographies. That combined with the fact that understanding it's happening all over the world led me to my roots back in China. Uh, I've been doing business between US and China my entire life. Uh, and I had this wild idea that maybe putting cannabis in China in the same, same sentence would actually have an opportunity. Um, and so in 2018, came over to China and started working with the Chinese government and understanding what the development of the industry was here. And uh, it had a really rare opportunity to be at the ground level of, of, of actually legislation developed here in China. Um, and turns out there weren't really a lot of operators that understood cannabis in China, uh, big surprise. And so I decided to start Asia Horizon to take the experience investing operating companies in cannabis space uh, over the past six, seven years and start anew uh, in, in China. What we see is that the development of the Chinese cannabinoid industry is probably what North America looked like six, seven years ago. Um, and we focus on two parts of the business that we think will be uh, the biggest winners in the long run. And the first part is that we see China leading the production of cannabinoids as an ingredient. 
we think that cannabinoid overall is just like any other ingredient, either in pharmaceuticals or CPG ingredients, of which China currently produces 70 to 90% all over the world. Uh, we're we're treating it as if in a global commoditized or um, you know in a global industry that the supply chain should look like what it does today for other comparable categories. And the other part is also very straightforward is that China we think will be the largest CBD market in the world. Just to be clear, THC is not allowed in China, but other forms of cannabinoid are, are allowed. And with 1.4 billion people in China and uh, China leading many different consumer categories, we think that will be the same for CBD. Uh, a fun fact that many people might not know is that the, actually the biggest market for a Budweiser is not America, it's China. And so we focus on these two parts of the supply chain as an early operator, uh, the only US company uh, to hopefully leverage what we've learned uh, in, um, in America uh, and build, uh, build from the beginning all over again. Very excited to be able to do so. Turn it uh, back to you, Anand. Great, or, thank or you, Brian. Appreciate that um, overview. And yeah, I think uh, CBD in China, uh, as well as India eventually is gonna be a massive, massive, uh, especially in the cosmetic side. So. Um, uh, I will next uh, go to another company here, um, this one out of the UK. Uh, if you, some of you who may have attended the last event or, or you know, since then have maybe caught up with some of the news would note that Grow, uh, which is the company Ben Langley, is CEO, uh, was featured in the news uh, with Tilray, which sent Tilray on quite a, uh, a market cap journey. Um, they are uh, they are based out of uh, UK and, and focus on the medical distribution side. But I will turn it over to Ben Langley to to discuss um, these slides and go over the story. Ben? Thanks, Anand. Uh, I think someone else has put my slides up. It might be the uh, I might have sent you the wrong ones. Do you mind if I I put them up myself? Sure. One second. I'll just introduce myself in the meantime. Yep. Uh, ben Langley, ex uh, investment banker, spent uh, uh, twelve years at, at J.P. Morgan. Uh, doing various things I won't bore you with, but uh, decided to leave JP Morgan in uh, in 2016 and started investing into various things. Really wanted to do something ethically better with my life and found cannabis as, as an investment class in 2016. Uh, was actually a member of ArcView, started investing into US companies and then Europe started to open up in, uh, in, in 2017. So became a, a, a European uh, cannabis first mover. So I'll tell you a bit about uh, Grow which I founded in 2017. If I can work this. Yeah, everyone see that? Yep. Good. Okay, great. So, so, so Grow is a, a biopharmaceutical company, but we focus solely on, on cannabis medicines. Um, so we, we fundamentally believe as a company that there are hundreds of millions of patients globally that, that would and should benefit from cannabis as a medicine. And ultimately a small proportion are actually getting the medicine in a, in a legal context, probably less than 1%. So we, we seek to solve that. We seek to, to improve lives through making sure that cannabis actually gets to the patients that, that need it. And we're ambitious. So we seek to be the world's leading supplier of medical cannabis by patient numbers by 2025. Uh, we've made a good start against that goal where, where UK and Irish leaders in terms of patient numbers uh, were cash flow positive in the UK as of, as of this month. Uh, and as Anand alluded to, we've got um, partnerships with companies like Tilray and Aurora, which hopefully speak to the, uh, the quality and the breadth of what we're building. So Europe, as it's been alluded to a few times, is, um, is opening up to medical cannabis. It started in 2017 uh, and market by market, it's, it's, it's opening up across Europe now. Um, so getting more and more exciting, uh, building more and more every day. The, the fastest growth markets currently are the UK and Ireland, which happen to be the two markets in which we are leader. And the biggest market at the moment is, is, is Germany and will likely remain so as well. And that's a market we're moving into uh, in the coming months. So, so what exactly do we do uh, and what is executing for the patient first actually mean? So, so for us, and again, it's been alluded to a few times, cannabis is not a, a homogenous medicine. Cannabis is not one thing. So recognizing the different forms of cannabis, different combinations of cannabinoids work differently for different patients. It, it's important to have a selection of medicines, a selection of brands, that will cater for as many patients as, as possible. So the, one of the ways, the most, probably the most tangible way that we go about making sure that patients in, in Europe uh, benefit from cannabis medicines is to make sure we have as many high quality medicines on offer as possible. So talk a bit more about our branded products in a second. 
cost behind that, uh, sales, distribution, dispensing, so letting people know it's there, awareness, dealing with doctors, uh, but also first class logistics, uh, which could be a real differentiator in, in, in an industry that's really just starting to exist in a legal context, supply chains being built from scratch. It's not simple to get right. So focusing in on distribution and dispensing is something that, um, that we've been able to differentiate with. And then manufacturing and trading. So in the UK, we've got uh, EU GMP manufacturing, which essentially means we can manufacture uh, cannabis medicines to pharmaceutical standards that, that will be acceptable globally. Uh, so these things drive price, availability, quality, and awareness well, now. So, not allowed to call our parents or no? They have to be here. Yeah. I can... Background noise. Sorry. Go ahead, so, um, you, you, uh, yeah. you put them on mute. Yep. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, the, I think I just said uh, supply chain now, and then in terms of moving the supply chain forward in future, uh, increasing the potential of this industry, we focus in on very targeted uh, research and development, looking at new technologies. Uh, there is a, there's been a huge dearth of innovation for a hundred years because frankly, uh, drug dealers don't have an incentive to innovate. And so the, the, this market going legal, there's a lot of low hanging fruit from a technological perspective, which we focus in on. And then clinical trials, having the data to actually uh, be able to communicate with doctors in a language they understand, actually showing people empirical evidence that this, this really works. So this has driven our leadership position in the UK and Ireland, and we're pretty confident this will also drive our leadership position into, uh, into Germany and beyond. I'll focus just very quickly on the basket of medicines because it's important, but I know I'm short of time. Um, so we've got exclusive deals, uh, one-way exclusive in our favor with Aurora, uh, Tilray, uh, Columbia Care and Brains, we also actually manufacture for, so we white label their products. Uh, and this again, just a, a pure patient focus, really making sure that we're, we're always focused on getting the best brands, the best medicines, the best selection to patients. We've also got our own branded products uh, that started out as, as compounding. So essentially uh, creating bespoke medicines for specific situations, specific patients. Um, through our R&D, we're getting increasingly innovative and that's a big push for our own brand at the moment, which we're quite excited about. So an example would be um, uh, asthma inhalers. We're, we're now putting cannabinoids into asthma inhalers for people that don't want to smoke cannabis, but do want to inhale. The UK is becoming the epicenter of European cannabis ecosystem. This is this is. Uh, I mean, it's, it's crazy right now in the UK. Uh, the, the deal we did with Tilray when we announced the, the, that they were going to be our partner in the UK, um, their market cap went up by $2 billion. Uh, it was crazy, but it's, it, it was great for us. Um, Jazz Pharmaceuticals buying GW Pharma. GW is a 20-year-old uh, UK cannabis biopharma company, so $7.2 billion shows there's, there's big money in this sector. And the London Stock Exchange opening up, um, it was a, was a huge moment for us for liquidity. Uh, for the UK, uh, the three companies that are listed on the LSE so far, all, all much smaller than us, have got very, very uh, healthy valuations, uh, real investor interest, great liquidity. So um, the, the London Stock Exchange opening up is a big moment for us. So, so just to conclude, why grow, why now? Um, so the true patient focus is a real thing. We execute with true patient focus. It's not just something we say. Um, we've got a first class team that's able to, to actually do that. Uh, logistical infrastructure, proprietary IP, uh, and all of this put together has established us as, as leaders in the UK and, and in Ireland, where we're seeing exponential growth, cash flow positive this, this month on a group level for the first time. Um, and and it, it, we feel as a management team, and I think the numbers and the success prove it, that the concept is, is somewhat proven. So this is a model we're now moving into continental Europe. And yeah, we're very excited about the, uh, the months and years ahead. So happy to take any questions when the time is right, but, but thanks for listening. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate that. Um, and then next up, I'll, I'll turn to uh, Eddie uh, Vanderpart, who's who's kind of now going to go um, from the, the fund manager thought process and can also double up as an investor thought process piece. And then I'll, I'll, I'll move to my, after Eddie, uh, to my co-moderator, uh, Jen Basic, and, and, and she'll be uh, tying into the angel investing space and then the vendor um uh, financing space, but um, Eddie, if you could speak a little bit about how you're involved in the space and, and both from kind of the, the impact investing angle and, and the, the piece focused on cannabis, as well as um, when you look at uh, companies, kind of some, some, some thoughts about um, uh, how, uh, how that due diligence process might work, because we're going to do your bio and then kind of start the discussion and then transition to, to Jen to, to do her piece. Absolutely, and uh, thank you, uh, Anand, for the invite. It's always a, a pleasure to speak here uh, in, the, in the network. Um, so, so I got 
in touch with uh, cannabis investing um, a number of years ago, I'm representing a single family office, uh, Polish, uh, American, so both on the European side and the American side, and with a number of investments in, uh, in cannabis, both on the brand side, cultivation, data analytics side, and most notably a, a tech and software infrastructure provider, Wheat Maps which um, specced itself to the NASDAQ uh, earlier this year under the name of SSPK, which um, is Silver Spike, also a friend of the network. Um, together with uh, my partner, Rich Sobel, we are uh, launching a fund, an impact fund, and one of the sleeves of the impact fund will be cannabis. And so we're very, very bullish uh, on that sector as well. And just uh, uh, to, uh, to reiterate, we believe liquidization is an irreversible trend. We're in the early innings uh, with professional management uh, more prevalent than a number of years ago. Uh, we believe the, the industry will grow really fast. Uh, and we also think that we haven't even touched the uh, scratch the surface of the medicinal value of the plant. So there's, there's a ton of upside, both in product development and as well as on the market side. Um, the way we look at investing is that we believe that a in this market, sort of the picks and shovel approach uh, works the best, targeting businesses that support the infrastructure of the cannabis industry, um, while avoiding growers, where we believe eventually it will be mar margin contraction uh, and there will be replaceable companies with not a lot of unique uh, defensible um, positions. Whereas we look for picks and shovel companies um, with a technology edge that are scalable and with management with a proven track record. We believe there's tons of those and, and our focus will be on uh, investing in the late seed stage through to series C. Um, and we can, we are flex flexible capital. So we, we want to support businesses either through convertible debt or preferred equity um, and could do a, a number of different things, a controlling position or a minority investment. Um, and that's it, I think, Anand. Great, thank you, Eddie, as always. Um, next up, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Jen Basak, who many of you already know from the network and from prior content in the cannabis space. And Jen, if, if you could kind of uh, talk about the angel investing space as well as um, uh, uh, introduce uh, and, and, and kind of go into the, the vendor financing side, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so uh, thank you, uh, Annan and Mark for having me. As, as Eddie said, it's always a pleasure to be here. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jen Basic, and I work at Fluence where I focus on exploring capital opportunities across cannabis and commercial agriculture. So essentially I connect the dots between investors and growers. Mike and Mark invited me today to talk specifically about angel investing, which I'm involved in, in my personal portfolio, as well as in my capacity at Fluence. My um, couple of minutes is going to be a bit more scripted, so bear with me as I want to make sure I hit all the points. So I'm sure many of you are already schooled in angel investments, but for those of you who are not, I wanted to briefly explain my approach, as I, I believe there are some folks in this ecosystem who are, are recently joining who are interested in learning about this. So first, an angel investor is an individual who provides capital for a business startup, usually in exchange for convertible debt or ownership equity. Angel investors usually give support to startups at the earliest stages when most investors are not interested in backing them. And as you've heard from many of the other panelists, when considering an investment, there are a number of different things to consider. So some of the things I think about is my experience in the specific sector, uh, the strategy that I want to deploy, the portfolio that I have and that I wanna grow and um, the stage of the com company. And I consider it a decision tree of sorts. So when I first consider an investment, some of the factors um, are, you know, do I wanna invest in a pre-IPO private company in a specific sector? What's my desired investment strategy? So for example, do I want a curated set of companies with moderate risk and high reward? Or do I want to invest in a fund or managed portfolio of companies with lower risk and modest reward potential? Then I consider the, my portfolio size and I decide which company stage is more interesting to me for that next investment. So do I want something that's 
early stage with high return, later stage with market traction. Um, so far, these considerations have proven to be a good formula for myself when I consider new investments across sectors. Right now, I have uh, investments across cannabis, hemp, commercial ag, tech, fitness, and sustainability. Uh, in terms of cannabis specifically, there are different paths to angel investing and different ways to become entrenched in it. Some of the things that I've done to really you know, keep my finger on the pulse outside of my everyday work in the industry is to follow news and information platforms such as Cannabis Ventures, which highlights funds and promising companies. Uh, there's also a lot of accredited and angel investor forums that I participate in. Tying Influence, uh, the company where I work and spend my day to day, given our presence as the market leader in all of cannabis technology, especially in the LED market, with our share larger than all of our competitors combined, we are in cultivation sites every week. We know the good from the not so good, and we have over 400 at scale North American installations. Also, we're in every continent across the globe. So we see a lot and we help a lot of folks operate their business with increased financial performance. We have our ear to the ground about new investment opportunities and are able to share both angel investments and debt financing opportunities with our network for their own, excuse me, for their own portfolio portfolios. And as I said earlier, I'm connecting the dots between investors and growers along with my colleague, Kurt. And we find out what folks are looking for and then we bring them deal flow. So that's like a big part of our every day. Uh, to that end, I would like to introduce Kurt. Kurt's heading up a new division for us called Fluence Capital. We're working on it together. It's an equipment financing ecosystem that at its core, by virtue of our reach in global commercial cannabis, allows us to work with angels and institutional investors to actively deploy capital in the space. So Kurt, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thanks, Jen. Uh, thanks, Mark. Anand. Um, good stuff here. I wanted to tell you that um, if it's not obvious, the U.S. cannabis market is absolutely zooming. Benjamin talked about the U.K. market, which is coming on strong. We have a team of nine in, in Europe, but um, in the cannabis sector, of course, for our company, U.S. cannabis carries us um, really, really nicely. Um, there's some big money coming in, as you've seen. And just in the last couple of days, um, just yesterday or day before, I picked up this article about the Coalition for Cannabis Policy and Lobbying Firm that includes giants like, um, that you didn't see in the U.S. before, only in Canada, Altria, uh, the Philip Morris uh, Tobacco Folks, Constellation, um, Alcohol, Molson Coors, Brinks, the um, Delivery Folks, the Association of Convenience Stores, um, these folks have uh, avoided cannabis in the past and are now uh, actively um, uh, lobbying in, uh, in several states and at the national level. So we're really, really zooming. We're working three, uh, we manufacture in Austin, we're working three shifts. Uh, we need three and a half right now. Um, uh, this time last year or nine months ago was a lull for us uh, as COVID hit. Um, and then as you guys know, the, um, uh, the retail just kept kept coming on, um, people buying cannabis uh, at the state licensed um, um, uh, facilities. And then our business picked up third and fourth quarter and we just can't keep up with it. So it's, it's all really, really good. And uh, I think our 400 commercial installations are gonna go to five or 600 this year. We work with about half of the, uh, or a little bit more, half of the top, let's say 50 in the US most of the, and these are plant touching, we work with cultivation firms uh, or vertically integrated firms that have a brand as well. Um, and most of the growers will know our name, uh, Fluence. We've, we've, we've enjoyed a, a huge ramp um, and now are at some of the revenues of our larger customers in the lower triple digit millions um, and, and highly profitable, no debt. Um, that said, my background early on with GE and in, in imaging and uh, most recently in cannabis, I started uh, the cannabis division for a PE uh, East Coast equipment, leasing equipment financing firm, uh, otherwise doing like forklifts and, and IT equipment and found that, uh, as you know, there's a, a lack of capital in space and there's a, a specific lack of debt for equipment. Um, hey, Mark, can you put on the Fluence Capital slide for me? Because I'll screw it up here on Zoom. Um, 
All right. Which slide? Uh, I asked Nessa to put it up also. Thank you. Um, so, so the the uh, there are several REITs, um, SPACs now involved in real estate. Uh, certainly, most of you all investing are looking at equity, um, and then there's general debt. Um, but for equipment specific, the players that understand equipment financing and understand cannabis, and I started uh, in this Hello? almost years ago. Hi. So um, um, I, I'm an old, uh, I've been around the block here in cannabis okay. a, a, few, a few times, but equipment financing is a specialty niche and there's probably two handfuls of companies that do it well. And in my network, there's probably three or four that do it well at the large size and then three or four that do um the do smaller uh, company, um, less established companies and startups. Um, but the capital program is just like, I, I'm in my car, unfortunately, because I have a noisy one and three year old and, and they're canines and they bark. So uh, the car I'm sitting in is a leased car. I leased it from uh, a manufacturer and it's very, very simple. The Fluence Capital Program, uh, shorter terms, 24 to 36 months, typical for other equipment might be Forty-eight. Who are your, who are your months. Who are your competitors in this field? Who do you go up against? What are the alternatives for the uh, growers? Uh, actually, my competitors are my partners. So um, there's a, a big one called Generate Capital. That's a, a huge clean energy fund that got into cannabis. There's a few local firms. Um, with moderate um, uh, rates. There's a few family offices actually that embrace, um, but it's not, uh, this is not a, a revenue producer for Fluence. This is an enabler for our customers, um, just like Ford Equipment Finance or Mazda Finance. This is an enabler for our customers to acquire our equipment easier. So it's not really a competitive game, Mark. That makes yeah. sense. Um, yeah. The private lenders are not really in the space, this equipment lending space. The private lenders for debt um, that you see, you know, purely for Tilbury raising uh, $50 million worth of debt, these folks are, are different folks that are in equipment um, because it's a, specialty, um, it's a specialty game. They have to understand the equipment. There are people that like our technology. Um, the secondary market, you have to be careful about if there's ever a default, what do you do with the equipment? And that's a big question um, uh, with ours as well as other equipment. There's not a real identified secondary market. So there's a, there's a, a, a relatively few amount of people that are interested in this niche. Uh, I've had, because of my background, seven or eight years here um, in equipment finance in four years with, with Fluence, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of people and to vet a lot of people. And I've tell Jen and, and the people internally, I've had about 50 discussions in three years with potential vendors of equipment. And I've only really brought on five or six into my network because uh, there's, there's a, a relatively small amount of reliable capital for equipment. So that's what I do. It's fun in the space. Um, and it's, uh, I think we'll see more and more capital, but even short of legislation, it's still a, a niche market. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Kurt and, and Jen for that, um, for that perspective. And so one of the things that came up was kind of deal flow and, and how to look at the space if you're investing. Uh, and so I think for the next 10 to 12 minutes or so, just to have an open discussion, and I'll, I'll, I can call on people as we, we develop that discussion. It'd be interesting to know, um, you know, who, 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 when going into the space, who should go into what? You know, if you're, if you're a high net worth individual, um, you know, unless you've got some connection to a company and you know the management is high quality, typically from a risk return perspective and, and management perspective, you would want to look at, um, a manager that is competent and is managing the risk on a day-to-day -day basis or, uh, or, or on a long-term basis has a theme to play out, which will give uh, outsized benefits uh, as, as that theme comes to play out. If you're a larger family office with enough resources to do your own due diligence and keep up with you know, 
uh, individual investments in the space. Uh, well, that that can then you can afford to have a, a larger allocation to direct investments. Although I would still kind of say you still need quality managers and access to their institutional information through quarterly updates and other um, deal flow access. Um, so if I could, I could just kind of go back to where I started with with Paul and you know, Paul, if you could talk about who are the type of investors that you, you mentioned, obviously the the hockey player uh, that did quite well, but who are the type of investors you're working with and what are you providing in, in specifics in terms of your strategy uh, to, to help them uh, kind of manage the risk return uh, uh, picture? Well, I mean, uh, you know, we're looking, we're looking for uh, new clients and because we think it's, we've already positioned our fund. Right? We, we have our 10 favorite long side investments and frankly, we're just, you know, we're rotating one or two a quarter, maybe maximum. Um, so we're kind of positioned. I don't think it's that difficult actually in this industry uh, to get, you know, quality exposure uh, because you, you buy these larger MSOs um, and uh, we would we'd love to get additional investors because we, we feel like we know the space and we're already positioned and so it's, it's not incremental work uh, for us. One of the major themes I would say is, you know, get a smattering of the largest companies and then, you um, m and is coming to the space for sure, right? The M the, these MSOs have grown from, from really three, $4 billion companies to, you know, something closer to, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12. So they've got the capital to, uh, to, to make purchases. And it's really funny that none of the big players are in California yet. I mean, I, I won't say absolutely none, but basically they're not in California and that's the biggest market. So how do you have all the industry's biggest players not being in California? So I would take a smattering of, uh, of, of uh, smaller cap, uh, you know, plays out west, uh, in California in particular, but you know, it doesn't matter, Arizona, Nevada, or whatever, uh, you know, get a smattering of these because you, you just know the big boys are, are gonna head west. And uh, uh, I think that's gonna be the exciting opportunity this year. You're gonna see lots of M&A. Um, and then how long do you think you're, you, you've said your position, how long do you think that theme is gonna play out best guess as far as, you know, are you looking to hold that for the next two years, five years? You know, what, what's the timeline? I think prediction is longer than, I mean, I, I like the, some of the commentary from some of your speakers on, you know, the medical aspect is, is gonna be tremendous. I agree with that hundred percent, but, but it's gonna take time or, or at least it will evolve over time. But I think the big opportunity in the non-medical side is next 24 months. Uh, I think the returns are going to be extraordinary. And then, then it's going to be like a lot of other industries, you know, well-capitalized, well-funded, well, -funded, well uh, you know, professional management, lots of competition. So, you know, uh, I'm not sure we can predict, you know, where the margins are going to be, for instance. So how can you value some of these things, uh, you know, more than two years out? Um, but I think now, I mean, you can buy, you know, Air Strategies just to pick a name, right? Air Strategies, is not, uh, it's, they changed their name now. It's called Air Wellness. They changed it last week, but the AYR the symbol trades up here in Canada. This company's trading at eight times EBITDA. Next year's EBITDA. They're in five terrific states. There's no way the company should be trading at eight times EBITDA. Forget it. I mean, uh, they're run by very intelligent people, uh, doing great. I mean, the stock's going higher. Verano just went public uh, the other day. They became a big player. In fact, they're the number two player on revenue in America. Nobody even knows who these guys are, but. They, uh, from a capital markets point of view, but they just went public uh, two weeks ago. The stock doubled out of the gate. Uh, it's still a buy because it's trading at you know nine times next year's EPTA, maybe ten by now. But it's too cheap. The others are trading at, at loftier levels. Uh, some of the some of the big guys are up around like eighteen times next year, two thousand twenty-two EPTA. So it's it's they've had a good move for sure. Uh, but you can buy some of the smaller guys at five or six, um, which is good value. I think in any industry, but uh, with great growth. So those are kind of some of the kind of things we're taking. But I think you're right. It's twenty. It's twenty-four months. It's between now and this time two years from now, and I think it'll all it'll all be done. Right. Yeah. Um, and 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 Maddox, um, could you talk about your kind of criteria when you're looking at companies and, and kind of some some of the resources and 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 and. and um, uh, kind of nuances and due diligence that you would have to execute uh, to, to look at the cannabis space? Yeah, so um, 
you know, I'd say it's a combination of different things from a deal flow perspective. One is certainly spending time with different different investors in, in different companies in the space on a regular ongoing basis. But a large component of what we do is a very proactive sourcing strategy, looking, you know, breaking down cannabis technology and infrastructure into specific verticals, right? So we spend a lot of time in the POS space. We spend a lot of time in compliance. We spend a lot of time on B2B marketplaces and wholesale. And each of those different verticals have their own nuances, right? So, you know, the POS space, for example, got funded very early, new retail channel, very obvious that uh, highly regulated industry needed something different than, you know, what was available generically in the POS space. Um, you know, the, the companies that emerged usually, you know, one in Cal a couple in California, a couple in Colorado, kind of regionally focused. And, you know, those, those companies did very well from a um, growth perspective at the outset, but then kind of when they moved into new territories that either had some nuance to the regulatory environment there or different dispensary workflows, they didn't grow as fast. And then, you know, kind of layer on POS companies, um, you know, generally relying on payments outside of cannabis to monetize and to make those unit economics work. They don't yet have that. So, that's just one example of, you know, spending time with every one of those companies that competes in that vertical to really break down, you know, who's got the advantage in terms of go-to-market, in terms of customer acquisition costs, in terms of, you know, monetizing and driving LTVs of those customers. So, um, you know, we kind of know who a lot of those companies are and we market map them and we, you know, we go out and we pound the pavement to meet the entrepreneurs and, and demonstrate that we know a lot about this kind of from our traditional tech investing backgrounds. Um, and then we supplement that with other things, which, um, you know, as I had mentioned earlier, a lot of these platforms, given they are being born today in modern times, whether it be online ordering or POS or wholesale marketplaces, um, they have tremendous data exhaust that they make available to the market um, in different ways. Well, uh, lunch, buddy? Some of... <laughs> Some of, uh, you know, some of this data is e more easily accessible than others. Um, you know, this is, I, I, Paul would probably know about this. This is obviously used across kind of the hedge fund universe, um, you know, measuring foot traffic at retailers, for example. And so we employ a number of kind of, you know, different uh, data strategies to ingest data from different areas that we think will give us an edge in, in kind of evaluating companies or finding uh, companies a little bit earlier than the, than we would if we were just um, you know not monitoring certain things and so it's not any one single um, you know kind of silver bullet but we combine you know kind of traditional boots on the ground really rigorous diligence with a, a data strategy to you know tirelessly work to find um, where we think the winners will be on the technology side much like we're seeing in the physical side of the supply chain, we're already starting to see consolidation. So if you, um, you know, and I think part of that is driven, the West Coast is very different than the East Coast from a market structure perspective. So you look at, you know, a state like Illinois, very centralized, uh, very much dominated by uh, GTI, Cresco, and some of the MSOs. And that is more so the case kind of east of the Mississippi. Whereas you look at, you know, markets like Colorado, California, Michigan, they're very, um, they're pro small business and they're very competitive. And so the type of software that builds moats in those two markets is sometimes different. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about market structure in different, uh, different states um, because, you know, that informs kind of product market fit and the extensibility um, to other areas. So uh, it's a very complex market that, um, you know, we're trying to figure out daily. And that's that's why I asked the question, because, you know, a lot of it is relationships and pounding the payment is exactly right. And it's so funny because every state is its own microcosm. And then you've got, you know, Europe and Asia in the, in, in, already represented in this conversation they're their own um, kind of geographies. And then there are some common themes across. Um, and so kind of talking about, you know, that selection process, we, we got a sense from the public side, from the private manager side. Um, uh, Kato, could you talk about when you look at a fund of funds approach and you're focused on that space, how you look at uh, individual managers in the space? 
Yeah, thanks, Anand. Yeah, I mean, we, we spent about two years on uh, R&D, just really trying to figure out what uh, what's really going on in the investing landscape of cannabis. And, uh, and, and so we kind of came out to our funded funds. But if you look at the entire investing landscape, you look at the public side, you've got, a, you know, 30 to 40, you know, uh, publicly traded companies, 12 with any kind of ADB on them. Uh, you've got a few ATFs that are out there, uh, you know, targeting different sectors of the market or trying to do the whole market. Then you obviously have different hedge funds, long only and long short and hybrid. And, and so those are all, I think those are all provide wonderful access for everyone uh, to get access in public equity space. And, and you can kind of just go out and get those on your own. But those are, you know, maybe tops 50 companies that are out there in the cannabis private side, just in the U.S. alone, there are thousands and thousands of, of companies. And, and what we saw in, in uh, 2020 is that, you know, I guess cannabis is essential. The business has really proven themselves. And now we really have a lot of, of growth and revenue to really you know, gauge and, and identify the different companies. And so what we looked at is you look at, you can go to kind of risk reward of one single investment. And we know what that looks like. And either be straight up and be straight down. You can look at an individual fund with 10 to 15 names and, and leverage the expertise of folks like Maddox and others on here uh, as they're leveraging their expertise to find uh, the, the best companies inside those specific spaces. And I think that provides you uh, some, some additional, you know, move up the chain in the kind of risk reward spectrum. Uh, but there really wasn't any way to get access to the entire market on the private side. And, and so that's what, you know, we really tried to look at is really to kind of democratize access to that side. Because what we found is that there are some really solid managers in this space that bring their expertise uh, from, from other PE firms that they were at, from larger you know, uh, mainline players that they were at, and really bringing their own investment thesis and philosophies about how they look at this market. Uh, and so we wanted to really leverage that. And so that and we felt like there were some really solid managers in the space. We felt that there was real expertise uh, and that we wanted to really harness that to pull that together so people could get access to all of them or as many as they could uh, through one K1, one investment. And so we looked at uh, we've looked at so far about 60 managers uh, in the cannabis space, about another 60 to 70 to go. Uh, we've unearthed managers that have not done any public relations, any marketing, have just been investing on their own, maybe some private money, uh, maybe their own money, maybe some friends and family, uh, and, and have built their, their businesses that way and, have, and have, are really solid investors with great returns. So if you compare the IRR of, of the different vintages of 2015, 16, 17, 18, and the like uh, with the broader uh, industry uh, using either Cambridge Analytics or State Street, you know, whatever benchmark you want to use. And if you compare the specific vintages of cannabis to the like vintages in the broader space, cannabis IRs are double and triple what they are in, in, in the broader space, even when you bring in healthcare and biotech. And, and so we just feel that this is, this is a rocket ship. And so we're just trying to capture that and really leverage the expertise of all the managers uh, on this call and others around the space uh, to really uh, drive that home. And so I think that the challenge for investors is that, you know, where do you fall on that risk reward spectrum? Uh, how comfortable are you with the kind of volatility that you'll get you know, ranging from, you know, uh, individual uh, securities uh, traded, publicly traded individual companies on the private side uh, to you know, a fund of funds or a hedge fund or, or a long only fund on the other side? You know, the, it's the industry is really starting to round itself out where you can get access uh, to these investments in a number of different ways. It is still not as robust as it, as it could be, uh, but we are in the early stages and pretty soon you'll find, you know, the, the, I think this next year, you're gonna see a lot of, you know, you will see a lot of M&A. Every single manager that we're talking to is pre prepping their companies for either a large acquisition or acquire somebody else, uh, either go public through a SPAC or their own IPOs. And there's a number of funds, there, there'll be several funds this year, probably at least at least four, maybe seven, that will go public themselves this year. And so there is a ton of capital markets activity that are happening in, in, in cannabis and that will benefit the public side, that will benefit the private side. So I think for investors, you know, just really trying to understand what the whole landscape looks like, it's a lot bigger than people think. Even when we got into the space, people said, oh, yeah, there's only about 20 funds in cannabis. So we know them all. 
well, we've already talked about 60 and we've got about 60 more to go. And so, you know, there is, there is a lot of diversity and diversification inside cannabis and really trying to find what is the best way for the individual investor uh, is, is something that everybody has to think about. You know, the early adopters have been family offices and high net worth. Uh, so I think we have to, what, what I brought to the space and what we're trying to bring to the space is just folks that, you know, hey, I like cannabis. I don't want to make a bet on any one area. And so let's invest in the entire sector uh, in a way that that adds risk controls and, and dampens volatility for the overall portfolio. But there is something for everyone in this space right now, and it's getting there. And soon we'll have enough uh, public securities for you know really robust uh, mutual funds uh, uh, to go to go into the space. And so there, there's a lot of growth in the overall investing space. Our fund is a U.S. only fund. The next fund is a global fund. We have plans for thematic and regional funds as well too. And so there's, there is tremendous growth to be had in this space. I think Paul uh, Beatty mentioned earlier, you know, we got about a $50 billion market cap and there are, uh, you know, we're easily going to $150 billion market cap. I remember getting into the space, somebody said, hey, uh, you look at Canada, it's a $5 billion market cap, market with a $50 billion market cap. And the U.S. was a, a, a $50 billion market with a $5 billion market cap. And that's shifting now and, and it will continue to shift. And we'll see some great movement in the 22 uh, uh, midterm elections. We'll see some more movement to the 2024 elections. And what I want to you know, tell people that are investors in this space is that all the federal regulations, everything that happens on the federal side is additive to cannabis. Cannabis is now is growing and thriving in the most restrictive regulatory taxation and legal system in the U.S. and around the world, but in the U.S. specifically, there are so many barriers to entry and barriers to growth in this space, and it is still surpassing those and growing those uh, because it is in demand, it is in growth, and there's more people that uh, want access to this. Uh, yeah, thank you. That, that's, those are great points. And on that front, I wanted to also mention, you know, I get uh, a lot of friends inside the cannabis industry talking about, hey, the taxes are so high, the taxes are so high. I think it's actually fine right now. For It's the biggest kind of... Um, uh, uh, kind of carrot we have with regulators is to, hey, come tax us, but let us in, you know, let us grow, let us get into new markets, let us go uh, federally legal. And then, you know, then our lobbyists, by the way, will make sure those taxes come down over time. So uh, I think it's a great Trojan horse for the industry. And um, I, I actually am I'm fine with that uh, rep. Uh, one, so, so that was great for, you know, giving people perspective on why you need skilled folks and, and folks who d pick the skilled folks to get access in a uh, risk adjusted manner and, and a diversified manner to the space and, and, and include those expertise and benefit from those expertise. And now I'll kind of switch to Eddie, if, if Eddie, um, uh, uh, Ben and Brian actually. And so I'll, I'll highlight one other aspect of this, which is information networks, right? So not everybody is privy to the same information. Paul uh, Giddy up in Montreal has seen all of these companies come through, you know, not too many people can claim that, uh, you know, Cato has done due diligence on all of these funds. Maddox is, is involved in that direct company to company pound the pavement discussion. So the other aspect I wanted to highlight, and, and, and um, if, if, you know, I can use kind of Eddie and, and, and uh, uh, Brian and Ben as an example is how portfolio managers or investors in the space that are, you know, have a sizable allocation are looking at connectivity because the, the other part of the story is also global. It's it's definitely, um, you know, North America has been kind of the lead in, in, in Canada, California, and, but it, it's turning into a global story. And, and so a lot of the uh, information that I come across is, is just connecting people to have a creative conversation. So I'll frame it as this, Eddie, but maybe uh, you could you could chime in on, on kind of how you look at some of the companies you know, Grow is focused on Europe and medical distribution uh, and it kind of has the market on, on, on getting to the consumer there in the medicinal market. Uh, yeah, uh, part of um, Asia Horizons business is focused on uh, uh, having a facility to process and provide uh, 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 active pharmaceutical ingredients uh, for the world market, basically given China, Chinese expertise on, on being a supply chain to the world, uh, a supply chain partner to the world uh, on many, many fronts. Um, so, so as you're looking at some of these companies, Eddie, and, and I'll, I'll loop in the um, companies themselves, how, how do you kind of look at the space, the opportunity when you're doing, doing due diligence and, and kind of what kind of questions and, and, and um, uh, connectivity have you seen? Maybe not even the cannabis space per se yet, but 
that you look for when you're looking at this this global perspective? Yeah, thanks, Alan. Look, look. There's the, the interesting thing is I we, we did a deep dive in cannabis. I think twelve months ago or a little a little a little more. You weren't at the scene at the time. Uh, uh, it was a much smaller uh, uh, number of people interested in it and a much more, uh, I want to say, um, discerning and critical crowd. Right now, 12 months later, everybody sort of says, okay, we believe these tailwinds uh, come, up with this, come up with a specific story. Why, why would I be interested? But the, the, I think the, the perception here on just on this network shifted from some, from like, like a majority of sort of critical sort of well, what is this cannabis uh, uh, deal? Can you actually make money with it? Uh, to uh, this is going to happen. Uh, it's a question of how and where. Where should we put our dollars? So that's that's one. And and you 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 are one of the proponents uh, of one of the sort of examples of this coming into this space with a lot of connectivity and bringing all these companies together. For me as an investor. As well as a spectator, by the way, I'm, I'm I'm thrilled because it brings me a lot of additional deal flow. I think all the companies you talked about that are on the panel are actually very very interesting companies with a lot of uh, opportunity to kill it. Um, and so, you know, but that, and and that's on the sort of the, the venture side. But let's let's look at the private equity side, right? And 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 there were there were a couple of comments about this about buying public companies for sort of you know seven to eight times. Um, in, in the private market, you can buy dispensaries for three to four times cash. Uh, if you have a play that will bundle a, a bunch of them uh, um, at some, uh, you know, new uh, ERP resources uh, on there. There's a company today that went uh, that that got two hundred million dollars uh, in in funding called Dutchy. No pun intended. Being Dutch myself, I had to say this. Um, uh, and they were funded by uh, Tiger Global, a massive institutional uh, uh, company, 200 million in cash. Uh, and they bought up some ERP companies at the same time, and they are providing a massive platform to roll this out for mostly for cannabis dispensaries to, to be more efficient and more effective in the space. So in the private equity uh, uh, space, uh, we're looking at that type, those types of plays. People who maybe just uh, uh, regular buy and build private equity players that say, all right, let's do this, but then in cannabis with my domain expertise. I've done it in other places. Let's do this. Let's buy five, six, seven, ten in a state. Let's do it in a couple states and let's see where we go from there. So th that's a fascinating PE play. And uh, on, the, on the technology and, and on, the, on the venture side, look, look around to AC Horizons, look at Grow. They have amazing stories to tell with a lot of upsides. I think uh, um, that's, that's exciting to to dive in one of the things obviously we we would look for as sort of uh, investors in those companies is management it still is an emerging market and will be for a number of years if you don't have good management who can't pivot and can't shift uh you can't really invest you, you will go on there because the, eventually the business plan will sort of be a different business plan you implement than the business plan you had because of regulations because of the volatility in the marketplace so that's the most important thing and then we think the technology has to have some type of edge some type of defensible position but th those are similar analysis you do in other industries as well so if you have those two and you have a growth story it's a it's a it's a strong um, it's a strong uh, chance we will look at those companies Thank you. That, that's great. And, and you mentioned um, kind of the pivot part and this this industry, and along with, you know, any industry where there's a startup, there's sometimes a moment of that pivot and, and, and a company either rises to it or doesn't. And, and you know, I think that's a key point. Um, ben, if you could talk about what's the, the, the trading platform that is part of Grow, because I'm, I'm intrigued by international supply chain. Basically, I, I believe that the black market supply chain in the globe, which is very efficient, very profitable, will need to be replaced with yeah. the white legal version uh, of that supply chain. Uh, so if you could talk a little bit about that that part of your business. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the point is exactly that, that uh, the supply chain um, in most of the world in a, in a legal cannabis context is currently um, not, not great, fragmented. There's a lot of demand coming on. There's a lot of supply coming on. So I alluded to my, my boring time in investment banking. Uh, I, I sat on the commodities trading floor for, for eight of the 12 years. I was at JP Morgan, so doing some interesting sort of physical transactions, whatever else. But invariably in, 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 um, in industries and in segments or in, in commodities that were uh, far more efficient and with supply chains far more established. And still there was huge opportunities, obviously, to, to make some money. 
so with with cannabis what our trading business uh, does is essentially i mean in many senses sort of relatively simple buy bulk uh, break bulk and sell to, to different locations but essentially linking up demand and supply so when you've got sort of huge growth and huge fragmentation in, in demand and supply uh, there's a massive opportunity to go out build global relationships with with the supplier and obviously have have those same uh, relationships with the with the sources of demand so hopefully that's not all too sort of economic and, and theoretical but to make it maybe slightly more tangible things we look at would be would be things like uh, tolling deals so we would off take a crop from a, uh, let's say a Spanish company um, up to a certain amount if it met certain quality specifications um, at this point on a risk-free basis just to be very clear we don't risk our balance sheet at this stage we would off take that crop and then we would run that crop through uh, pre-contracted uh, processing capability to turn it into the medicine that we need to be and then we would get it through to our distribution on the ground in the UK and in Ireland and in Germany and also sell uh, a portion of that to third parties. So th this stuff is as old as, as old as commodity trading in terms of sort of this happens with soybeans and whatever else every day. Um, but we're, we're approaching this as grow in, a, in what we think is a relatively sophisticated way in terms of just making this, this supply chain grow up a little bit. Um, so making sure we're actually focusing in on opportunities to make our supply chain better and in doing so also helping others and obviously making some money for shareholders in the meantime and importantly making sure we're actually getting getting the cannabis to the patients uh, whether on a macro or a micro level great thank you for that and you know one of the interesting parts is at some at, at some point and this is all already happening in, in vertically integrated plays and, and some relationships where you can forecast what the consumer demand is if you're um, patient facing or consumer facing and figure out which genetics are needed and and kind of go down uh, the supply chain to the cultivator, inform them who may be working with a tissue culture or genetics company to customize what's gonna be grown into future demand. And so those kind of relationships can really make an impact on um, the high quality, right timed product coming out in, 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 in this, these chains versus you know just cultivation operations where they're hoping to sell what they've got to the broad market and it's not targeted and it's not a rifle approach. Well, I had one last question then I'll turn it over for questions from the audience which, which are starting to, to queue up. So please put that in the chat as, uh, also if you wanna um, queue up for, for your questions. But uh, um, uh, uh, Brian, if you could talk about the Chinese domestic demand and Chinese domestic market on the CBD front because I think this is one of the, the, the biggest opportunities and it's one of those things where CBD in the US was not known and then it became a household name within I feel like three to six months. And then I had to explain to investors and people who are new, you know, what cannabis is. They, they all thought, hey, it's all about just getting high and smoking it. And, and, and so then when CBD came along, I could explain cannabinoids as a category much more easily. So could you kind of cover, um, you know, your approach and, and what the opportunity is in, in the Chinese CBD market? Sure, sure. So I'll quickly look over and I think I'll explain it from two levels. One is from the investor perspective as a former fund manager in the cannabis space and then also from the operational level. And I think if you look at the history of the development of the cannabis market uh, as a fund manager, look at some of the, cap you know, some of the key, in uh, key signs that contributed to success over the past six, seven years. Uh, I would say that uh, you look at the, the whole reason that Canadian companies are successful is how early they had access to the capital markets through the CSE, uh, TSX, et cetera. Um, there were actually capital available in Canada to fund those companies. And even today, there's a huge arbitrage between the valuation of Canadian companies versus U.S. companies. Uh, and the second part of that is looking at new markets and understanding what's the addressable population and how many licenses are available in that market to address that uh, set of consumers. And that still holds true today in, in any number of jurisdictions in the U.S. or beyond. And, and when we look at China, both of those are present. It's the U.S. and, and, the, and Canada combined together. Um, China's financial markets has never had access to any cannabis opportunities. The whole wave of legalization has floated beyond all Asian investors, Chinese investors. You look at some of the past six months, there's been a, a, a tremendous number of the successful Chinese IPOs uh, that's, that's happened. I think one relevant one people might have heard of would be Juul in the US. But in China, the Chinese equivalent of Juul just went public at a $33 billion valuation, just their Chinese business. They didn't even IPO the rest of their Asia business, let alone South America and beyond. Uh, 
So I think from the capital markets perspective, there there's a huge opportunity as uh, the Chinese market develops. And uh, there's only 16 licenses available in the entirety of China. China will never take the same approach to licensing because just how sensitive cannabinoids are overall. And then from an operational perspective, um, Asia is coming online for CBD demand. There's a vibrant community in Japan today for CBD consumption. Where are they getting their products? Where are they getting their ingredients? Um, so from an operational level, looking at China, not just as a global uh, uh, distributor of CBD ingredients, but also a regional, looking at Asia standalone, where are regional Asian players, Asian countries going to derive their ingredients, their products? Um, and I think that it's not just about China, but China is sort of the greater China and APAC area. So I think from both those perspectives, those are all of the signs that I saw in the early days of the cannabis market in North America, and it combines the best of both. And uh, we're very lucky to be on the, on the ground early here and being able to recognize some of those signs and exactly build to uh, build those values. Thank you, Brian, appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna open it up now for the, the questions. Apologize for running a little over on my segment, but hopefully the discussion was informative and we got a flavor for all the different parts of this full spectrum investing uh, panel. Um, Jim, you had a question, I believe you, you, you posted on chat. So if you want to uh, start off there. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks to the panelists. Really great information, really good look globally. Um, my question is more about the domestic picture. My background is in payments for cannabis, legal and licensed cannabis. Uh, and so uh, we talked a little bit about Dutchie buying uh, green bits and leaf logics, which has an ERP feel uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure. Um, but more specifically, they, uh, at least one of them are really related to the point of sale, right? And uh, in my experience, point of sale is a huge obstacle to the growth of the industry because when you can uh, basically alleviate the need for cash only, uh, in my experience, you see somewhere between a 15 and 30% lift at the register, right? And so I think we can agree that that's seismic. Um, so I'm interested in the panelist perspective on changes to the landscape related specifically to payments. Um, the entrance perhaps of the big guys related to the credit card industry and uh, other ways that um, making consumer transaction a little bit smoother and, and uh, more possible uh, will, will impact the industry. Anybody want to uh, take a, a stab at that or? or... I'm happy to, I'll, I'll go first. Um, so, I do not know the answer uh, in terms of what is going to play out. Um, payments is very, very tricky, as you know. There are a lot of kind of, you know, a number of suboptimal solutions, whether it's closed, you know, closed network credit cards that aren't really broadly used on the rails. You know, these are all workarounds because we can't use Visa or Dis Discover or Amex rails. So, um, I think you have a, a spectrum of uh, solutions that are, um, you know, probably cuspy on a regulatory on the regulatory side, um, but also suboptimal from a consumer side. If you think about the adoption of, you know, Google Pay and Apple Pay, for example, that took years for. And it's still still abysmal. And it's still abysmal, but you know, so you know that took years to even get a little bit uh, penetrated. Uh, so, you know, the, the challenge of some of these, you know, cashless apps, it requires the download of a separate app for, uh, to be able to go into a dispensary. And sometimes those apps are only specific to that dispensary. So you had to have to download another app. So it's basically a huge mess right now. Um, it seems to me that, you know, particularly the deal that you mentioned, um, you know, in part of the POS thesis a while back in some of the investments that were made was that payments was going to be, you know, coming sooner than it was. I think, um, you know, if we were to talk about payments and uh, that becoming more visible, you know, six months ago, I think, you know, the SAFE Act was, you know, passed the House, COVID hit, and, you know, it was just, it would pass the Senate, it had a lot of bipartisan support. Since, you uh, you know, since the election and since the runoff, you know, now social equity is the question. So I don't think you're going to get the passage of safe as a van vanilla standalone thing um, um, until, you know, until it's wound up with some social equity. So I wouldn't be shocked if payments, you and I walking into a dispensary and using a credit card, you know, it could be 
two years out, maybe. Because, you know, after after the law is passed, you know, Visa and, and MasterCard are going to need to figure out how they're going to play in this space. And that will take some time. So I don't think it'll be overnight. I do think that if you think about high risk and low risk payments, nutraci nutraceuticals and adult film, like or adult websites are very high risk, just as an example. This, given it's so highly regulated, once you know, once access does open up for normal financial institutions, I think it will turn to low risk very quickly, much in the way that alcohol and, you know, liquor is low risk. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, dispensaries will use kind of the cashless debits, which are kind of cuspy, I think, but they'll you know, kind of keep using them. I do think the POS systems, if they can, um, you know, if they can manage the burn until the payments can turn on, you know, I think there is there is value there. If you talk to any retailer, we do a ton of expert network calls with a lot of folks in the industry. You know, the, the POS is like mission critical, the nerve center of everything that goes on. So, you know, I think there will be a couple winners out of there. You know, maybe it's Leaf Logics and Greenbits as a result of this Dutchie deal, but there's still a ton of fragmentation across the landscape. So I don't have the answer. That's just my ramblings. No, it's, it's good, good info. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, we have a question also from uh, uh, Brian uh, uh, Nazaro, if you want to ask about the compliance question you had. I do. And do you mind if I just do a quick thought on what Maddox was just saying of, of how you move war with finance? And, and so my, my answer is a uh, former chief compliance officer for multinationals and a global compliance officer for a high risk digital only international transfer agent is that it really comes down to guidance. And a lot of this is high risk because you don't know what you're allowed to do and you don't wanna be the first one that the government takes it out on. And so I think really what it comes down to is the canvas, uh, the commercial canvas industry looking at this and saying, well, what's the approach to compliance, which leads into my question of, you know, when you're doing your due diligence on these um, companies, are you looking for a specific approach, liability only, risk-based, um, you know, what, what does it mean to the due diligence? Because there are some that give deferred prosecution stances, some that help with managing the encumbrance on the licenses. What's actually important to investors as they're, they're looking at these companies? Any takers there? I'll jump in here and on, on end if you want. Sure. So we talked to a number of, of obviously uh, funds, uh, debt and equity. And so on the debt side, I'll speak specifically to kind of that, that uh, compliance question. You know, these folks are all looking at uh, the individual states going to limit the license states, but also understanding, you know, where they can put in some covenants that protect themselves because obviously there's no federal bankruptcy. Uh, and so it's not these, these, these debt funds are not operating in all states. They're only operating in the states that they can you know, reasonably get their money back or have some ability to do a workout. So the, some of the things that they look in there, maybe it's not they're looking from a compliance perspective, they're just looking from a risk uh, management perspective for themselves. So they are, uh, you know, doing change of ownership uh, of bank accounts. Uh, they are uh, funneling accounts receivable through their own system before the, uh, the operator gets paid. Uh, there's two and three times collateral. Uh, about two years ago, there was a lot of talk about monetizing or valuing uh, uh, the dark license or the dark value of the license. Nobody's doing that anymore. Everything's looking at real hard assets. Uh, the next chain that's coming, the next wave that's coming down the debt side is going to be accounts receivable financing. And, and every large debt player right now is gearing themselves up for you know, some regulatory changes and, and, and some the ability to, to do that because that will kind of change the landscape as well too. Right now, it is mainly MSOs and cultivators and dispensaries that are getting uh, and, 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 and testing and labs that are getting that equipment financing because they have the collateral to do so. But once there's that shift towards account receivable, that'll open that up for a lot more uh, uh, private credit lenders to get into the space and they'll have their own you know, kind of compliance and risk control measures that they have uh, that they're doing in there. But a lot of it's each individual investor is, is creating their own compliance narrative and, and guidelines for how they invest in these companies to ensure, at least on the debt side, that they're, they're, they're protected if anything goes south. Luckily, last year, if you look at, you know, look at all the debt funds and REIT funds that we talked about, it was less than 1% of the, 
of all of the issuance that had any trouble uh, with making payments last year. There was no workouts. There was really no defaults. Uh, there were really just folks that had to, you know, kind of exchange, you know, change some payment schedules and the like. Uh, but everything worked out by year end. And so, you know, the, the cannabis operations are, are cash flow heavy uh, and, and, and asset heavy. And so that allowed a lot of these lenders to make these investments. And every one of these guys have said that if these were companies that were, you know, on, on you know, mainline companies or trading on exchange and you give a, a, a rating to them, these would all be triple B single A companies getting single B triple C rates. Thank you, Connor. Um so I'll, I'll, it's coming up on the hour and I know folks have to run. So I'll, I'll open the, the ending of the conversation with what I call the, the mulligan question, which is don't feel like you need to know anything about cannabis to ask your question. Don't feel like it's a stupid question. You get a, a mulligan for, for asking it. So if anybody's on the, on the call that would like to ask some, some sort of you know, baseline question that helps them understand the industry better or how to invest in the industry better, feel free to jump in. I guess everybody's an expert on this line. Well, so so I'll I'll think of a question. I'm on every hole, so it's a, it's just <laughs> <laughs> especially with my like little primer on angel investing. <laughs> yeah, so, so thank you for the primer. That that was excellent. So, <laughs> I'm so sure it, most of you already knew that, but you know, it's, there may be some folks that don't. No, I think the way you you described it was helpful. Uh, just framing it. Uh, so in, in terms of as somebody who's an investor who's had you know, different uh, experiences, success, bumps and bruises. And so, so you know, I, I love to see this panel and this panel, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't really come together unless it was a collaboration between, you know, um, the, the 361 network and, and, and the connectivity that, that you know, I, I brought there as well as, you know, obviously Mark already had uh, and, and the other folks that participate and, and are so generous in contributing names to, to participate in the events. Um, uh, you know, one aspect to kind of think to it, which is exciting is if I wanted to invest to get the most benefit out of cannabis, it, and I'm kind of as a, as a CFA charter holder and, and somebody who used to be on the board and, and is interested in um, academic writing about alternative investments and the right uh, uh, allocation models, I'm working on a, a co-authorship talking about how would you invest in, into this space? And what I see is if I had $10 million uh, to invest, I would do a combination of, of the different choices here because I think in many ways, um, they are very differentiated in what they provide from a diversification value and uh, provides, provide expertise in, in their own bucket. So you can play the broader public markets that are more liquid and you can go long short through somebody like Paul. You can, you can look at, hey, I don't know who the best managers are, but I, I think I, I, I believe that managers overall that are uh, selected based on a good criteria could fit in with uh, Kato and what Park Green is doing. Then I can look at you know, individual managers and, and, and actually overlaps into this space. Uh, you know, just like Paul's fund is not just cannabis focused, although he does separate accounts. He, he also looks at commodities and, and, and arbitrage between Canada and the US. Uh, you know, Eddie is focused on impact investing, but has a sleeve, a significant sleeve in the, in the cannabis space. Uh, I can look at uh, somebody uh, like uh, Maddox and L L2B where they have uh, expertise on the tech front that they're now applying and have already got uh, portfolio companies that they've uh, Im implied that in, in, towards um, in, in their strategy. Uh, I can look at, you know, Jen uh, and, 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 and how uh, Fluence is, is doing the vendor financing and um, what that means in terms of their uh, positioning in, in the space. Uh, and then I can look at individual companies. If I believe there are certain themes emerging that are very big themes and are kind of in markets that are somewhat going to follow what happened in the U.S. or Canada, but also have their own interesting uh, dimensions, I can look at uh, you know Ben and, and and the team there at Grow and and look at the the market uh, they have created in the U.K. and Ireland and are now entering Germany. And I can look at Brian and and, and John from uh, Asia Horizon in, in terms of the CBD opportunity whether it's brand related or processing related in, in China. So, you know, this, this really covers such an interesting um, combination of all the choices that we were presented with today. So I thank you. I, I learned a lot myself and always excited to talk to folks within the industry. Um, if there's anybody else who has any final thoughts or Mark, I'll turn it over to you if you want to give any, well, any thoughts. Everybody's so bullish. That always worries me. <laughs> um, you know, look, um, 
I'd rather hear from like somebody who's, but what, what are we afraid of, right? We say, well, we're excited about what we're afraid of, you know, what, what gets in the way. I'm looking at you, Kevin O'Brien, you're in insurance, right? Um, somebody, I just want to hear what, what we're afraid of, what's going to get in the way and how we, how we deal with those things. Look, I think that there's always going to be a, a lot of risk issues that hit this industry. Uh, right now, we've got an inefficient, you know, functional, efficient, uh, functional insurance market, but, um, you know, it's out there and you can get it. I think, uh, you know, to your comment about, you know, what worries me is, I think, uh, you know, you take like last night, there was an acquisition, Green Rose Acquisition uh, Corp, another SPAC announced like a four company roll up massive, massive growth numbers out there. You're connect, you know, four, five disparate businesses all of a sudden becoming one with like one 200% growth in some of their individual sub, you know, I, I, I think some of these expectations might, you know, hit, hit bumps. You know, I think there's going to be a lot of integration issues. I, I think the vertically integrated model is more complicated than, than some people are letting on. So I think, uh, you know, think of another industry where there's something like that that's been built. Um, so I'm, I'm very bullish. I own a lot of stocks. I, I love this market. But, you know, I think that's, you know, those operational efficiencies are, are going to leave some question marks on landmines. Um, but with respect to the insurance and risk management side, you know, I, I think there's just so many unknowns. Um, and what's keeping you know, all the insurance capital on the sidelines is the lack of, you know, any sort of, you know, progressive regulation like the Safe Banking Act, which, which we need. Uh, once that happens, you're going to get, you know, a, a trickle of, of added efficiency into the marketplace, but it's not going to just happen overnight. Um, you know, I'm working on a, uh, you know, I've been working on a couple of IPOs uh, lately, and uh, you know some of them are putting twenty million dollar retentions on the uh, on the on the primary insurance layer. So you know that's significant. If you went back four years ago, those would be two and a half million. So there's still a lot of reticence and caution uh, in this marketplace, but it's changing a lot. There's more players, there's, and there's more options every day as people dip their toe. Anand, if I could add. Yep, sure, go, go for it. Yeah, I, I echo that. So my, the thing that I worry about is really just the public markets. We've had this great froth in the public markets. It's being led by you know just a few stocks, a few technology stocks as far as the overall market. And then the ease of use that, uh, that SPACs allow folks to go public. Uh, there, is, um, there is absolutely uh, an, a, an incentive for companies to take, for SPACs to get people public. I think SPACs are a fantastic option for the sponsors. I think they, they're great for the sponsors. But I think for the long term, for investors in those SPACs, uh, I think that, yeah, the, the, the jury's been out. I mean, there's tons of articles that come out from uh, HBS, from Booth, uh, talking about the long term returns of all of these SPACs. And, and they're, they're mostly all negative. I think something like 80% or 90% have been negative three years later. So the, the rush to, to capital markets, you know, predicated by the fact that we have, you know, federal illegality has created these, these disjointed paths and, and ways for folks to go uh, public and get access to the public markets. That's what worries me. And, and, and then the, the downstream effects of global pa uh, capital markets and, and, a, and a big downturn there and how that affects the overall private market investment. Th those are the things that I worry about, just the effects of the public market on my private market fund. And that was the reason why we chose private markets only uh, because we just had this crazy bull run for the longest time. And you know, I don't know about the next 10 years, but I don't think it's gonna look like the last. Hey, Mark, can I two cents? Go, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I, I think um, with the people that we deal with in, in, in cultivation, it doesn't apply with branded products so much where you can move a brand between states is either right now this year, specifically with some states getting together and barking about um, interstate commerce, how to, how to move THC across state lines. And then when the federal overhang comes down, what that's gonna do to the whole market. You know, I've, I talked about these big tobacco and alcohol. Are they gonna own part of the market? Probably. Is there gonna be a two segment? Is there gonna be a Bud Light grown outdoor and then a premium craft beer, you know, maybe? How about imports into the US from Colombia and other places? Those are interesting um, and, and dynamic 
swings that are going to move the market, probably not this year, but pretty soon. I was just going to say my, my biggest fear also is, is the government. I, I'm just not a government person. Uh, my wife had worked in government and it just made me more fearful of government. Uh, and I, I just I have this sense that, you know, I, I might wake up in a cold sweat as soon as the, the senators kind of really rally around it and try to, you know, make it into a sweeping, you know, event where they're going to, you know, try to handle a bunch of different aspects and they're going to screw something up, you know, and they're, they're going to handicap some key part, then they'll come back to fix later. But just, I'm, I, I hope there's really good lobbyists working on it and uh, I hope they come up with a, a, a good uh, solution. Uh, well, that, that's what happened north of the border. That's what happened in Canada. Government got, you know, government got too involved and screwed it up. And so it's a real problem. And by the way, just to be sure, uh, just to be clear, we're not bullish on the Canadian names. I mean, uh, take the largest, Take Canopy, try to figure out the valuation of Canopy, and they can't really become a big player in the U.S. So, <laughs> so Paul, Paul uh, I can't remember his name, but the CEO wanted to uh, get in our, our event. <laughs> the ah, just, ah, just, I mean, it, yeah, because he's got nothing else to do. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not bullish on these names. Anybody but, who's telling you that you should own a Aurora stock, Aurora has issued stock every month since its existence i mean uh, come on this is not a very good company and uh, so i agree the, 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 I, I, the government could screw up this industry that's possible for sure but i think uh, it's looking pretty good in the states i don't think uh, they're going to allow the import of thc into the u.s from abroad for years to come i just don't see it i mean it's all about jobs right i mean come on what, uh, you're opening up your new industry uh if you do it, for sure, a lot of cheap products going to show up. That's for sure, for sure, for sure. But you think we can't grow inexpensive uh, cannabis in the U.S.? I mean, come on. We got plenty of farms out here in Oregon that uh, there's oversupply all over the place. And yeah, uh, yeah. I think what, one thing I heard recently was that there's you know there's going to be a split like federal uh, you know oversight over the medical and leaving rec to the states. Uh, I haven't heard a ton about that, but that's kind of a newest trend that that would be really interesting and I think some of the uh, you know mistakes that were made north of the border I think uh, you know hopefully we'll get you know uh, a little more opportunistic um, perspectives down here. Yeah so um, I have a quick uh, question to the group here uh, on a couple fronts. One um, I'm actually in Arizona here and uh, I've seen a number of products uh, cannaboy products that show up on the shelf and, you know, uh, you know, the, the higher end food chains and things like that. So, um, I see a, a battle happening with shelf space just for that, uh, new influx of new products on the, on the, the shelf there. And I think, uh, seems to be more fastly adopting, uh, buying the products than, um, you know, states kind of rolling out approval for, um, those to be um, sold in the states. And the other question that I want to ask the group here is about, um, it seems to me like I, I do know of a couple companies or at least one that I'm uh, associated with in just uh, finding information about in the medical research for cannabinoid for healthcare or treatment of therapeutic uh, um, various types of uh, um health issues. And um, it seems like this company's um, kind of really putting a lot of money in the investment part and R&D and trying to even file patents on uh, different things that they're trying to do in, in uh, research in, in that area. So I, I'm wondering if some of these segments are probably a little more safer initially until uh, for investment until some of those issues at, at the whole macro and in the, in the global um uh, uh, discussion topics here are, are cleared up. Any any thoughts from panelists or otherwise on that? 
I think there are a couple, I mean, there are a couple of things just to kind of parse it apart. I think you were, one of the things you were referring to was, um, you know, kind of CBD, not THC being sold in like the natural food or high end food channel. Um, and, you know, that part of the market is under a different type of regulatory construct via the farm bill in 2018, which has its own challenges given um, you know, the FDA has not provided a whole ton of guidance for the companies that, you know, make non-THC, but make other cannabinoid products, you know, mostly CBD and other kind of non-psychoactive cannabinoids. Um, you know, I think retailers are getting more comfortable. Most of the products you'll see on the shelves will be topicals because um, they're just less, um, you know, they've, they're, they're, they're not as, I guess, potentially unsafe in, in some cases as ingestibles. But I think, you know, that's a very separate channel than the THC channel, which is, you know, now newly alive and well in Arizona, where, you know, there's a real psychoactive uh, compound in THC within those channels. You know, that channel is regulated, you know, almost entirely separately um, based off of, you know, um, you know, kind of the state construct. Um, you know, we'll see how, but the markets kind of behave very differently, even there even though they're, they are somewhat related. Um, you know, I, I think retailers on the CBD side will, um, you know, I think we'll probably have some movement on the FDA or at least some more guidance kind of probably by the end of this year. And you'll probably see more retailers taking different types of CBD products. Um, but I think that's largely, you know, separate from THC legislation, which is, you know, very focused on this highly regulated new channel in, in each of these States, Arizona being one of them. I think one of the other things that, you know, will be really important in the CBD market in the future is the like synthetics that will, you know, add a consistent ubiquitous ingredient. Uh, right now, it's kind of like, where is this coming from? What is this? How much time does this company spend on choosing the additive that they're putting in, because it can be kind of like this, like placebo type of type of. It's like taking a vitamin; you don't really know if it's working, you know, uh, till it's not. But uh, you know, there's some really interesting, you know, companies like Creo Ingredients and some other companies out there that are using really cool, like uh, you know, kind of innovative lab technology to develop, um, you know, a consistent, repeatable process to get a to get an ingredient base commercially scalable type product. I think that's going to be a big part of the future. Any other uh, questions the audience or discussion no, points? I have a question to the audience. Just what, what do we want to do uh, with this uh, series that we're doing on, on cannabis? You know, we, we did international, we did across asset classes, uh, you know, we have lots of groups. We could marry, you know, we could put venture. We did ag tech. We could do pure cannabis te tech. We can do uh, angel. We can focus on the public markets. We can cultivation deep dive. And bring in the lobbyist that, that was here, but he couldn't have a chance to speak. Just talk about your, your risk of uh, government uh, actions. You know, just we can bring pu public policy people and and. I, somebody knows, you know, I was about to say the future governor of New York, but somebody knows the, the person, the people who are writing the, the legislation, um, and we could bring those voices in. Um, I could bring, what's his name, Fast Five Freddy, who's got this documentary, uh, you know, the criminal justice system aspects of this. Um, and, you know, what, what do people find interesting or, or all the above? Hey, Mark, this is Dave Kroom. Uh, I think a couple things in that space um, as far as merging ideas is obviously market expansion. So yeah, if somebody has insights to the emerging markets, if that's New York or individual states, I think that'd be really good. And second, uh, thinking about like even Paul Betty's fund that's Canadian only and then adding feeders to allow access. I think that whether it's venture or otherwise, uh, what's the first point of entry for somebody to invest in cannabis broadly? Uh, either they're out to pick individual stocks or they're looking for fund managers that actually have a handle on the marketplace. Um, I, 
I, I'm not sure which groups are most active in in actually transacting or moving cash into the mm-hmm. into the pro- cannabis. I don't know. Do I see? Is Eddie? Is he moved on? Uh, I guess that to say, Dan, I think you know the smartest money in an emerging market is definitely not to go direct, unless you're going to take some bets on founders and go early with, as an angel. But right. uh, to go, you know, go to fund managers who look at two thousand deals, and uh, you know, got track records. That's my take is that let them do all the homework, right? And then, and then kind of pick up, pick winning horses at yeah, the fund that. level. But then I think part of that is just a, a showcase of who's doing what out in the marketplace. And, and I think let people um, start engaging more directly with those managers. I think that maybe that's a good start. And they, and they can benefit from us as well. Uh, with certain fund managers, either from deal flow or helping their portfolio companies. Oh, for sure. So, so just, um, just a, a topic that, um, I don't know, maybe of interest or not, but uh, I have, there's a company here that does surface protection uh, services and they have a product that's um, green and actually an amazing product that kills viruses and mold and everything. And um, they've actually tested this on uh, marijuana plants and different things like that. And it actually uh, helps main, uh you know, for maintenance and uh, protecting your crop and different things. So there are other in, uh, uh, related industries um, that have solutions for different things that aren't really kind of out there yet um, that I am aware of. But uh, I know those are probably some, you know, smaller investments or maybe just uh, types of industries that, uh, um, you know, there's going to be a demand for as it, uh, this stuff unfolds. Well, I'll make one caveat that, that maybe is relevant, Luke, is if one of our families has invested in 10 or more cannabis companies, it basically acts as a sponsor, has put money in, is going to put more money in, and we like the deal, then they could, they could be like Maddox. They, they, could, they could be a fund manager, effectively a fund manager. But just to go directly, like you're going to see exciting technologies, like you might know three or four companies, Luke, that from time to time. And I just want to know, make someone, make sure someone has done the diligence from A to Z. Um, sure. And then if we can all add value, what Anand is doing, and I, I love partnering with him, he's creating like this whole supply chain. He's helping, I don't know if he's, he's helping a grow in Spain, you know, connect to an entire chain down, and they might even go to, into Asia. Uh, if, and if you can be value adding and, and be effective, but uh, but, but I, I would like to, we could do a circle up on, on it, look at directs together. Yeah. Uh, if, if there are just a tag team on that mark, you know, if there are direct companies that anybody is looking at and I have a whole due diligence process, you know, it, it, it starts from phase one, which is I cut out a lot of the BS that, that might be coming from it. Not to say this is an example of BS, but you know, there's a lot of BS companies out there. And so I cut those out pretty quickly and easily with my staff. And then most of my deal flow is also referred. So anybody referring from 361, you may not be aware of whether it's a good company or not, or the application is appropriate or not, but feel free to send it uh, my way. I've got a whole process around it. And then a lot of times, yeah, I interact with folks like Maddox and other fund managers, and I talk, tell them about deal flow that I'm really liking, and, and they might have a portfolio company that would be perfect to do an introduction. So cannabis is, is you know, not quite super competitive as a place yet. And, and the people who build up too many walls tend to actually um, kind of get injured from building too many walls, I feel, uh, in, in the space. So just like Mark has done with 361 Firm, which is, you know, a very open platform uh, for exchanging ideas, I think that's, that's key in cannabis. So, um, you know, feel free to reach out for that.